Welcome into ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitra. Coming up on today's show, the Braves are the best team in baseball. And there's a position room in Flowery Branch that is crowded, so who's the out man out? And there's somebody in the DB room that thinks somebody in the QB room is that dude. And last but not least, and for the culture, Outcast put on for the city. <laughs> this is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. I want to start off by saying thank you for making ATL Day Ones your first listen of the day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast and wherever you download your podcast. Make sure that you leave us a five-star review. Really appreciate that from you in advance. ATL Day Ones is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day. Now, T, when you think about what happened last night, the Braves rallied in the eighth inning to take the lead and the win from the Philadelphia Phillies in the opening game against their division rivals. And now we've known the Braves that are, are one of the better teams in Major League Baseball and scoring in the first inning. But... In the last two games, T, they've shown that they can get it done late in the games. And now I'm starting to say, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon, that this is a trend, and the Braves are now proving that they are the best team in baseball. Yeah, And they are back to form for us because this is what the Braves country, the fan base has seen. This is what Major League Baseball has seen. This is what the NL East has seen for the last, several years is a team that yes starts off strong in the leadoff position all the way through to cleanup but really it's the comeback because they were the cardiac kids remember that was their hashtag for the last several years I feel Mm -hmm. like they're back to being that and Jarvis what was most encouraging is kind of who was in there doing things at the most opportune moments right so if you look at it from like you said from the perspective of coming back in the late innings if you look at it from the perspective of the bottom of the order starting to show up if you look at it from the perspective of players whom the Braves had counted on to have big bats coming back with big bats. It's just what you said. They're showing why they have the best record in baseball, why they're the top team, if not one of the top two teams, at least in the National League, in Major League Baseball. They're they're really starting to go with functioning on all cylinders so that every time, you know how it goes, Jarvis, every three, five, seven games, we get a little nervous, get a little shaky, like, come on, Braves. And then all of a sudden, something comes back to the fore. And I want to talk a little bit about that in just a moment, because I know we got some other kudos that we want to give out. But I want to talk about Brian Snicker and Alex Anthopoulos just in a few moments, because man, oh, man. They are the decisions that they make, the nuances that they do are really part and parcel to why we were able to see something like eight and eight to five yesterday when it looked like, oh, man, Dylan God. Oh, man. But it didn't turn out that way, because to your point, you've got Austin Riley, eight straight games with a hit, two hits, his fifth multi homer game of his career. But most importantly, Mm -hmm. this is another game back to back games now, I think, uh, a Jarvis with with home runs. Marcel Ozuna with the big bat, eight home runs in the month of May and Travis Darno. You get him in there for all of 45 seconds of real time. And yeah. what does he do? Nothing but produce. Man. Yeah. Good one. And, and those are those cylinders that I feel like is, are very important. And here's the reason why. Because we know that Austin Riley has been struggling. And I think yeah. that this all started to me, T. This all started back in that Toronto Blue Jays series. Now, I know that it was ugly. They got swept out. And everybody was concerned, including myself. But one of the things that really stood out to me in that series against the Blue Jays was the fact that Austin Riley got those two little rinky-dink singles, and I was just like, you know what? This could be the beginning of something beautiful. And ever since then, T, he's hitting 314. He got a not, a, over 900 OPS, and he got three home runs and eight RBIs. So all those things are starting to come together. Of, co- of course, with Marcelo Zuna, we talked about ad nauseum on this show as far as like, okay, when is this dude going to start getting it together? He's getting it together to the tune of, like you said, eight home runs. And and Chuckery talked about this on his show as well. Dude probably going to get player of the month more than likely for the yeah. National League. So th- these are the type of things that when you're talking about cylinders hitting on all, flying all over the place and getting it, getting it together, this is what we're talking about with the Braves. And I think it's all starting to come together beautifully. And I think that when you talked about Brian Snicker and Alex Anthopoulos, 
Brian Snicker came through last night too, cause hey, when when in the clutch, when he knew that you know they needed a hit, they needed to, to get 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 some um, runs on the board, he decided to put draft go with Travis Darno and in, instead of Michael Harris in that moment, and Travis Darno, little D as Mike Bell affectionately refers to him as, he came through. He he did indeed, and it's the little nuances to say, listen, Dylan Dodd didn't have his best game. Four runs that he gave up in five innings. But the most important thing to Brian Snicker was, can you just give me five innings? Can mm -hmm. you just give me like three yeah. strikeouts, which he did? Can you just not walk too many batters, which I think it was about three batters that he walked? And yes, yeah. four runs is a lot. But when you're looking at the bigger picture, you just made a great point. This is the first series and the first of 13 games against your division rival that ousted you. I like the fact that the Braves started what I'm calling the 2023 revenge tour against the Phillies. I like yes. what they did to say, hey, it doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to be a lights out performance necessarily by my pitcher all the time, my starting pitcher. Sometimes it is my bullpen. Nick Anderson had a really nice game, right? So Iglesias yep. closed that thing out last night. So it was really good, but it goes all to decision making from Brian Snicker and being able to really silence everyone and just kind of, hey, keep the noise out of there. Hey, Michael Harris II, I gave you a day off. But I think mm -hmm. I see something today that tells me Travis Darno may need to get in there and pinch hit for you because he'll give me exactly what I need at the point where I need it to get us over the hump. So that to me is just amazing. And then, two, we can't speak about what other teams in the league do because we cover the Braves, right? And we kind of follow the NL East. But I also think it's the just the fortitude to say, hey. Ron Washington, you're the guy who got Austin Riley to where he is now. Let me get right. him back to connecting with you so we can check huge. on what. Yeah. So being able to see kind of, yeah, and saying, wait yeah. a minute, it worked before. Maybe I need mm -hmm. to get him back with his guy to get the mechanics straight. And now here we are talking about him having two monster 456 and 458. Who's hitting yeah. that? Nobody's been hit. Nobody's hit that in five years in the same game, by the way. So you mm -hmm. have those kind of situations where that goes to decision making. And of course, like you said, with Alex Anthopoulos, we've all been screaming to the rooftops, media, fans and the like. Can somebody just please, please exit stage left Marcelo Zuna? But here we are. Here we yep. are. And whether yep. or not he becomes the guy who continues to give run support for the Braves or whether or not he puts himself in position for Alex Anthopoulos to trade him because now he's valuable again, still advantage, good decision-making Alex Anthopoulos. Absolutely. Um, there were some good decisions being made last night up in Boston. How about this? Um, don't look now, T, but here come the Boston Celtics. They've established, they established last night that they were the better team by defeating the Heat 110 to 97. I just got a simple question for you. Is it going seven? Probably. <laughs> right? Like but it's you the know Celtics, what? Right? Like yeah, it's two games right. that going to convince me. Right. I'm sorry. Nope, exactly. Because it could have been, look, the heat, you know how we say down here, Hawks are going to hawk. The heat, yeah. heat, heat are going to heat. That's what they did last night. These, yeah. these are going to see. That's what they did the first three games. To yeah. me, it is so crazy because we don't know, Jarvis. To me, I, I don't mean to like be a cop out, but let me give you a rationale for it. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Butler has still not 100% shown you Jimmy Buckets yet. If nope. he shows up as Jimmy Buckets in game six, we're done. We're done. Yeah. You just don't quite know because I still say, remember he had, he, what is it, game three where he, he took that really hard fall? I still mm -hmm. wonder if that has had some type of impact up. on him. We don't yeah. know if Gabe Vincent is going to go. That was quite an ankle sprain that he uh, experienced in game four, right? Yes. So don't know if we're going to see Gabe Vincent again. Tyler Hero did start shooting because, remember, he was listed for a moment as questionable for game four and, uh, excuse me, game five. And he ended up not playing, but he's doing shoot around. They may yeah. actually need to bring him in because right now, Jarvis, they just cannot get the ball in the basket. And it may not seem like that's a big deal, but the Celtics were always a team that took threes and made threes. But then yeah. this series, they were just taking them, just taking them. All yep. of a sudden, Jarvis, 40% last game, 41% this game, and a whopping 51% from the field. The only thing that keeps this, game, this, this uh, series from not going seven is the Celtics in their mind. If they yeah. get in their own way mentally, then, yeah, this is over in game six. But if they can keep their heads out of it, then they get to game seven. And you know what, Jarvis? As a Yankees fan, there was such a time where nobody in the history of Major League Baseball had ever come back from three games down. But as a Yankees fan, to another Boston team, the Red Sox, they did it for the first time. 
at some point, somebody has to do it. LeBron's team of Cavaliers came back from 3-1. That deficit had never been bested in the NBA Finals. Somebody has to do it, Jarvis. It's just a question of, like I said, does Jimmy Buckett show up for me? Or do the Celtics get their mental right and get it to game seven? Yeah, I think one of the things that you have to really take into account is the fact that, that's, look at the starting lineup last night. It had Kevin Love and, and freaking Kyle yes. Lowry in it. Kyle Lowry yes. is a, 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 a special teams linebacker at this point in his career. So, yeah, we don't need to see him in that starting <laughs> lineup. There is a reason that this dude comes off the bench. Now, that's the only way he can be effective. But when you have a guy like, like Gabe Benson, I feel like I know people are like, oh, Gabe Benson, who's Gabe Benson? He has been very a key shooter. for the Miami. He, he's been, he, he's a shooter as well. So I think that with him being out of the lineup is key. Whether or not he's going to play in, in game six is going to be huge. Now, playoff Jimmy needs to come on through. Absolutely. However, like Kyle Lowry and Kevin Love, Kyle Lowry does not yeah. need to be starting That At the end of the day, no. like, you can't have two liabilities no. essentially right there yeah. on, in that starting lineup, especially against a team like the Boston Celtics. I think that, that's going to be something. Robinson, Charles, where's Duncan? Who? Duncan? Okay, <laughs> who? Sit, there it is. Who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you know who showed up last night big time? Like in that whole, you know, how, how you have like kind of that seven-man rotation? Derek White. Mm -hmm. Derek White yeah. showed up. And Jalen Brown six, said. Six of them things from, from deep. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> the end, Jarvis. Period, 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 Jarvis. You stopped it right there. We don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of, you know, not talking about things, we're going to talk about the Atlanta Falcons coming up next because that running back room is crowded, T. Somebody is about to miss out in 2023 on this Falcons office. We're going to talk about that next. But first, I want to let you know that this eighth episode of ATL Day Ones is brought to you by Built. Dot com because it is the number one protein bar in America. T and I have been getting our workout on ever since we started this Locked On Sports Atlanta thing. They were like, hey, y'all, try out these bars. We was like, okay, cool. And then, you know what? We found out that they were amazing. Absolutely amazing. 17 grams of protein, only four grams of sugar. What, 130 calories? Oh, my gosh. What are you talking about right here? This is talking about a pick-me-up when you head to the gym. A churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut. Whatever flavor you want, they drop in flavors every month. So all you got to do is go to built.com and check those bad boy out. And last but not least, I got to tell you about this. This is very important. So listen up. How about this? If you're tired of ordering from your crib and you want to get out the house, because I feel like that sometimes, you want to get out the crib and you want to go pick up some built bars in person, you can do it. You can do it right now. You can go to Walmart, get the four bar box. You know what I'm saying? Have that little per se right there in your little middle console as you're going into the gym. Or you can be like me. I got, I'm got. i a big man. I like the big boy boxes. You can go check that out at Sam's Club. So head there today if you want to go pick it up in person. Or you can go simply go to Built.com and get yourself a Built Bar. Now, the Falcons have closed out the first week of voluntary OTAs. It was a good look from all accounts, Jarvis. I know you were up in Flowery Branch this week. We'll both be at the Benz next week and are excited to be able to see that. But, whoa, one of the first reactions that we both had, both – for mini camp, for the rookies, as well as this week, is there are some crowded position rooms. There are some serious competition, maybe none larger than the running back room itself. But John yes. Robinson is showing us that he he probably has the goods, right? And yes. not just the goods on the ground, but he's going to be a serious threat for the passing game as well. Tyler Algier, he said that he and Bijan are the kind of guys that are like soaking it up from one another, right? He's learning from Bijan so he can be a better pass catcher. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, can you imagine Tyler Algier actually besting what he did last year? But he's on mission. And then there's Cordero Patterson, who literally set everything on fire for the Falcons in the beginning of the season. Of course, he did have an injury. And I think just being an older guy, he just kind of sputtered out at the end of the season. That's understand, just understandable, just fatigue. But that said, and those are only the top three, because there are others in the running back room that sometimes we low-key don't talk about, but they could have a stellar year just like Tyler Algier and kind of be the cream that rises to the top. Jarvis, I think there will be some serious competition all the way through training camp to see who's truly going to be RB1, RB2, or RB1A and RB1B. But I wonder at the end of the day, whether you think about it from a statistical standpoint, who gets in there on third and long, who gets in there when they're in the red zone, who do you feel like might be looking like the outside looking in? 
I, I, I think it has to be Cordell Patterson for, for what you just mentioned, right? He's like, he, he's getting long in the tooth. He's, you know, I think 30 years old, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So when you think about, you know, that being at that stage and taking those hits later in his career, because, you know, he got moved to, you know, hold a running back spot specifically, you know, when he came down, like he was being used in different spots in Minnesota. Yeah. But I think Arthur Smith more focused on using him at that running back spot. Now, of course, he excelled. But I think once you have guys who this is what they do and a guy like Tyler Algier, who you found in the fifth round last year and then the number eight overall pick, you know, that kind of automatically sets him at RB1. And I, and I think that they're going to I think Arthur Smith is going to play around with that and not explain myself in just a second. But but I think Cordell Patterson overall, he's the guy that's going to be left out because when you you think about him, you know, being in this space, right? Because I, I look at it from this standpoint, pass blocking. Tyler Algier, that's something that he he was really good at in his rookie year. And you don't normally see that in rookie running backs because those one that's one of the determining factors that keeps rookie running backs off the field because hey, you know, you got to block dudes. <laughs> you, you know, you don't just get used, you know, uh, or just get hand, hand the ball off like you do in college. And, and it kind of doesn't work like that. So when you have different game plans and different um, systems coming into the NFL, they have to be able to do that. So I think Tyler Algier is going to check the box on that from that aspect of it. And I think he said something really interesting to me uh, yesterday when I when I asked him, about you know what their role will will look like and what that you know the offense will look like with all of these guys in this running back room I, and he said that hey everybody's gonna get the opportunity to eat yeah I, I do i do agree with him but some people are going to be eating more than others T. <laughs> right yeah some people may be eating entrees some may be eating appetizers Appet or hors d'oeuvres hors d'oeuvres <laughs> kitty meal be ready yes. but i do think that what that's going to be is, yeah exactly yeah so, somebody's not going to be happy with their uh yes. their meal selection if you will or but you know Jarvis, deal you with actually it, you know? right that's what i was about to say yeah. you actually put something out there that i think is interesting because what i do know about arthur smith is he has his players buying into his system right right and so mm -hmm. cordero patterson i think is going to be that guy who says use me however you will however you will so if that means that hey marquise williams is the benefactor of him not being used so much in the Maybe running back room something. or in the backfield exactly mm -hmm. then that gives yep. him opportunity to be more effective and really make that special teams core something special so i still right. think there's something there and also you talk about maybe some of those low red in red zone uh situations right, right. where uh, someone like cordero patterson and it may just be because of veteran experience where he may be able to see okay i know that what it looks like is that i should go straight up the middle but i'm watching this defense and i know what they're about to switch so i actually need to go around this defense in order to get into that end zone, there may be situations where Arthur Smith and Dave Ragone know that CP is still the best guy, or it may be a third and one, and you just want to throw a team off because first down you ran it, second down you ran it, but you ran it with whatever Bijan's strengths are, you ran it with Tyler's strengths. Maybe CP comes in third and one, or even fourth and one. So that's what I love about him the fact that A, he's versatile, and B, Jarvis, you and I have been in the room when Dave Ragone has lit up at the fact that he finally was able to get Cordero Patterson with him, right? So yep, I just think uh -huh. that that's a positive thing, that Dave Ragone is going to make sure that he finds a way to utilize Cordero Patterson in a way that they think is going to not just be good for the team, but be good for CP as well. Now, another thing, Jarvis, that I thought was very, very interesting, speaking of, well, this is a room that has actually been shrinking and shrinking, right? Yep. Such that we know that we know that we know who QB1 is. There are no questions about that but here's what Absolutely. i thought was interesting it's one thing for arthur smith and dave are going to say hey you're a guy you're qb1 we're rolling and we're rocking with you right and for terry fontenot to back that up by not going out and drafting a qb if you will or saying hey lamar jackson thanks but no thanks we'll move on mm -hmm. now yep. it's another thing for the offense to say that they're behind him we heard it from the o-line saying how excited they are that they're a cohesive consistent unit that'll be able to give him the kind of pass protection that he needs and then from his running back room to his receiver room. But when it's most impressive to me, Jarvis, is when the guys on the other side of the football are believing and buying in. Richie Grant joined our guys, Carl Dukes and Mike Bell, on the Dukes and Bell show a couple days ago. And actually, I think it was just Mike Bell. It was the Dukes and Bell show because, of course, Carl's daughter graduated from high mm -hmm. school, so he hasn't been there. But Richie Grant said that guy is the hardest working 
in the building. He was like, basically, we are riding with him. We are riding behind him. And we believe that he's going to do some special things because nobody is working harder in the not just the QB room, but in the building overall than Desmond Ritter. Jarvis, as someone who's played on the defensive side of the ball, how important is that to know for QB to know that he has not just the 11 or the 10 other guys on his side of the ball, but really to have the entire team behind him? It is so important. Like, T, I, like when you were talking, I started thinking back to when I was in college, right? And, you know, there was some, so, um, a couple of years early on, you know, in my college football career that our quarterbacks, you know, we had like a rotation of guys and they used to switch them in and out sometimes. And it was just office kind of really struggling. The system wasn't conducive to what those guys' uh, capabilities were. So it was a lot of just a lot of unknown when it came to the offense side of the football in my first couple of years. But as I moved on into my junior year, oh, we had a transfer. Yeah, <laughs> that transfer portal was working even though it didn't exist back then it was working back then and it, it, then we got a guy by the name of Yule Joyner T Albany legend the dude came in of course you know I'm out I'm being my I'm being my silly self I like hey man you ain't earned jack around here so I don't care what you did when you were here in the Albany and I don't care what you did at the other school that you came from so you got to prove yourself and oh my after that first game T I was like yep this our guy, and and we rode that bad boy till we couldn't ride it no more. T and I, and I think that when you have a guy like that come in, and you have, you know, not only have the guys on on the, on the, on the office side of the football, um, you know, buying in, but when you prove yourself and you show that you're you're all about that action, or you about you really about that life, and to the defensive side of football. That kind of amps things up a little bit. And when you see, have a guy like a young guy like Richard Grant saying that, also, when you have a veteran guy like Calais Campbell, because he mentioned this in conversation the other day as well. He said that he watched film on Desmond Ritter when he was going through his free agency process. So when you have guys saying, okay, he didn't even know the guy. He's like, he sat down and watched film of this guy. He said, you know what? Based off of what I see on this film, this dude can get it done. And he go and plus he was on the road against the Ravens as well, playing against them. So all of those things come into play when you you starting to think about that belief, right? The system. They, they talk about the culture. Austin is always talking about culture and everything like that. That's part of the culture. When people believe in the quarterback, because hey, that's the most important position on the field. And if people on both sides of the ball believe in them and they're getting behind him, they see him putting in the work, and then they start to see that transfer onto the field. Falcons might just be onto something special too. Yeah, I believe they are. And two things. Number one, I think of him as a quiet dog, like a quiet assassin, because we always talk about wanting to have players with that dog in them. When you're right. going to go to your running back they and don't. you know how to nuance the conversation and yeah. tell Bijan, hey, that was great, but here's kind of how you made an error. Here's, here's how you could reset that. But doing it in a way that you nuance it to, a, to make it receptive for him, I think yes. that's huge because you're showing you. subtly a command to the rest of your offense, but also a respect to a rookie. I think that's powerful. And the other piece is this. You and I were in the building post-game when Grady Jarrett had, had it up to here last, last season. He yep. just had it up to here because his defense had done everything it could possibly do to put the Falcons in position to win, but the offense gave the Falcons absolutely nothing. Yep. And just to hear what Calais Campbell had to say, I feel like, yeah, Grady Jarrett and the rest of those guys are going to go to war because they know, hey, if we put you in position to give you the ball back, you're actually going to do something with it. So I absolutely love what I'm hearing from the defensive side of the ball, that they are confident in what is brought to the table. But what do you guys think about that? I mean, how is ex exciting is it for you to know that a guy going into what his third year is like that excited about his Second year, almost rookie quarterback, because I mean, he only had four games last year. Tell us what you think about what Richie Grant had to say. What about what Calais Campbell had to say as a veteran? I think that's exciting and very powerful as well. And do you guys have thoughts about that running back room and how much that competition could mean to have a fire under the Falcons offense? Tell us about it. Check us out on YouTube, like you always do. Put the comments in there. Even while, you know what, Jarvis? They're home for a three-day weekend. They might as well binge watch ACL Day 1s and tell us all the comments, and we can check them out. Come back to you on Tuesday and tell you what's what. And don't forget to download us wherever you download your podcast, because if you're out there on the road traveling for Memorial Day, why not take Jarvis and Tanisha with you? Absolutely. <laughs> Come on. Who else would you like, rather have?
Nobody. I got that's the answer to that question. But T, nobody. This is, nobody. But T, this is for the culture. It is the intersection between sports, entertainment, the culture, and sometimes whatever the hell we want to talk about. Because that's just how we get down on this show. Today is no different. T, when you think about like <laughs> events and, and being mm-hmm, able to mm-hmm. put together certain things, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like the yeah. outcast bobblehead night. When I heard about this, oh, I was dear. just like, you know what? I'm an old man now. Like, I ain't going down there because I already know I'm going to get disappointed. But, you know, when you think about the turnout last night and the idea of putting this thing together, it is just absolutely amazing how everybody, I'm talking about black, white, green, yellow, orange, blue, purple, like everybody loves outcasts in this city. And for them to be lifted up like they were last night, and on, on full display, I absolutely love it too. Absolutely. I mean, it was everything. It was everything. Like, we were literally over at 92.9. We were jockeying for position. Our guy, Bo Johnson, who will stop by the show at some point and kind of check us out and download with us. I got Bo Johnson literally was texting us back and forth because, of course, he works for the Braves as well. And he was texting, yeah. our, texting our guy, Oren, and me saying, hey, look, uh, in these bobblehead streets, you all need to get down here fast if you want one. Because, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because of course, Oren already had his tickets, right? And yeah. then I was on the fence because I, I was uh, potentially going to get complimentary tickets. But I, I didn't mind even buying a ticket for something, like you said, that, that was oh, that historic. Yeah. However, yeah. I had another historic uh, event that happened uh, yesterday. So it was really great to be able to speak with Coach Mark Rick. So when you get an opportunity to speak to Flex. and hang out with Coach Mark Rick, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're going to like, yeah, that bobblehead is good, right but that, Mark, yeah, that bobblehead is good, but that Coach Mark Rick conversation was better. Just saying, Absolutely. People. Absolutely. But I did check, Jarvis Loki, I did check to see like how long it would take me to get from Athens to Truist Park yesterday, two hours. And by the time Bo said, T, 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 T. Don't, don't do it, sis. Don't do it. Because it, by that time, Jarvis, it would have been over. Because people, I would have gotten there at five. People had literally been on the lawn in their lawn chairs, camped out since noon. Since noon to get a bobblehead. But I'm mad, Jarvis, because A, I still have FOMO. Yeah, I'm still hating on you, Jarvis, and all those people who saw that Outcast Farewell concert. Yep, 25 still years, traumatized and triggered. Still embedded yeah. in my brain. My yeah, wife is amazing. Here, too. Here, too. The pain of it all. So I kept thinking I was going to see like Andre, but I did feel better because someone posted a video that he is still in Japan. Yes. So I do still feel a little bit better because I thought I was going to miss him. But, uh, you know, big boy did an amazing job, even on the broadcast. Like he was so cool in the booth. And like you said, just being able to honor guys that truly put the city on the map and truly made the world know that Atlanta influences everything. That was just so exciting to see homage paid. But hey, PSA to the Braves organization. If you guys want to go ahead and like create more than fifteen thousand bobbleheads for Outcast, fifteen for forty thousand people, Come the on. third largest number of people to show up for a Braves game in the history of Bravedom. Come on, the man. other two being World Series games. Yeah. So okay, Braves. Forty-three thousand. Good. Yeah. Come on. Now. Hmm. Okay, oh. I'm over it, Jarvis. I'm over it. I know I need to let it go. Oh, no, let, let it go. Do that. Like we need to let start a petition. Like, <laughs> hey man, we need at least twenty five. Like, yeah, let us get cracked out of heads, You know what I mean? Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. At least over half the people that come to the ballpark will get them. Come on, yeah. that makes sense. Let's do it. That's, y'all cut the check. Come on now. All yeah. this money y'all making off of 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 of, 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 of the battery and everything like that. Yeah. Come on, cut that check. Uh, Derek Schiller, stop playing around. If I come up there and dog gonna do something crazy to you. That one, that's not a threat. No, uh, no. Because, you know, we, let's I'm be a nice big black man, and uh, I don't need to be talking like that. I'm sorry. Please forgive yeah. me. And we want him know. to be nice and give us a bobblehead, y'all. <laughs> not ban us from the building. <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't do, do that at all. No, definitely. Uh, but, yeah, hopefully, you know you know what, T? You know, my boy Three Stacks wasn't there. So, hopefully, he'll see what all the, the turnout and, and say to himself, you know what? I do feel like we owe them an album. Big, let's go ahead and get this thing done. That's my prayer. Like, I know I'm supposed to pray for certain things, but you know what? You know, uh, my, man, my main man said he prayed for that stuff. <clears throat> uh, but I'm going to say, I'm going to pray for a doggone outcast album. You know what I'm saying? I think God understand. Don't you think so, T? 
Yeah. Well, at least for a farewell tour. (laughs) I mean, because that was just a farewell concert weekend. I think we need an entire tour. Yeah. We deserve that. God. Like, you know, just depending on how they feel. Like, if they don't, if, if, if three stacks don't want to travel around the world and all that stuff, you know what I'm saying, and, and give the people a farewell tour, and you just want to get in the studio, that's more than welcome. Man, oh, oh, man, no, man. no, no, no. I was I'm thinking cool. like a farewell tour, not like the world. No, no, I was thinking like East Point College Park, and then you get like... You know, <laughs> that's all over the state. You know? Yeah, just, yeah exactly. that's all I was... I, no, I, I'm looking out for the tour. A. <laughs> not even statewide, just OTP, ITP. I'm just looking out for us. Sorry, well, you people. know the metro Atlanta, the metro area yeah, metro. almost expands yeah. to the whole state nowadays. Anyway, well, that's so. true, so true. You, you know what? That you are absolutely right. But yeah, oh my goodness, we would love that. But Jarvis, real quick before we wrap up, the one uh, thing I wanted to ask you is this too. Of course, we all know how important Outcast is to this show and this, to the culture and for the culture. But absolutely. is there any bobblehead that you would want to see? Entertainment bobblehead or athlete bobblehead that you would be like, "Yep, I would stand in line for that bobblehead." Right here, right now. Ooh, probably Prime. That's the first I person knew it. I remember. I knew it. Prime. I knew it. Like, yeah, I can ask, look at me who's how your second want. person? <laughs> tell, okay, so tell me your second person, because I already knew you were going to say Dion. Ooh, this is kind of be a left field. John P. Key. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. A that, gospel that's, bobblehead. That, yeah, exactly. And would it be that's singing? My... Well, now, would it be singing Never Would Have Made It, or would it just be a bobblehead? Like, would it be a singing bobblehead? No, nah, just, just a regular bobblehead. Just, yeah, regular, just okay. a regular bobblehead. Okay. Because yeah, you know if I have a body, my my Beyonce bobblehead better sing. She better oh, yeah, dance. She better, yeah, yeah. 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 My bobblehead so who's your second? Since it. we already know that was going to be your first. Like, who would be your <laughs> <laughs> Beyonce? Who would be your know, first? Right? <laughs> I know, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, no. That better be. Yeah, Beyonce better be my bobblehead. And then I think from an athlete's perspective, it would probably just be, I'll still say Jerry Rice. Okay. I'll still say Jerry Rice. Yeah, yeah he'll be my I'll yeah, he'll that. be my bobblehead. I'm good with that one. Or or all right, people can dream, right? Michael Jordan? Hello? Huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, we now, now you know there's gonna be some litigation involved, some rights I fees, some I know. cuts of the checks that has to be done before we yeah. Start. And I'm only gonna release like twenty three thousand of them, twenty three hundred. Yeah, he'll release like twenty three hundred of them, and then he'll be like. No more. And then all of a sudden, like six months later, another limited edition. You have like, a jersey on and say 96. Like, what right. like, who is this dude? He'd be six, seven. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. You already know. Yeah. He would, yeah. So I probably should go with Jerry Rice because, yeah, yes, we'd have yes, far less of issues. Yeah. Let's go with Jerry. Yeah. Yes. I rock with okay. that. Well, well, folks, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, participating or listening to and watch or watching our debauchery for the past five minutes talking about outcast and Bobble, Michael Jordan bobbleheads. We appreciate you uh, for making ATL Day 1 your first listen. And also our everydayers, we love you and we appreciate you. So if you are an everyday, make sure you drop a comment in the comment, bo- comment box. You know, we appreciate you guys. We'll give you a shout out on the show. And T, got to let the folks know that we won't be here on Monday. But however, we will be back on Tuesday to download with you guys about the Braves. Hopefully they continue to kick the dog on Phillies behind because that's what we're looking forward to. Um, you know, we need that in our lives, you know, especially come off this Dodger series. So, you know, if you guys don't do anything else, make sure you stay safe out in these streets. You know, more, more, you know, you know, more day weekend, you know, get a little crazy. And make sure that you share love, show love, and most importantly, spread love. Thank you.